My name's Rob Ainsley, I'm web editor for the Henry VIII exhibition, and I'm here at Hampton Court Palace with Brett Dolman, who's curator collections at Historic Royal Palaces, and we're here to talk about the field of the cloth of gold. Brett, can you just explain what is the field of the cloth of gold? The field of cloth of gold was an enormously expensive party. Um, It took place near Calais um, over two weeks in the summer of 1520. It was also a European summit. It was the first meeting of Henry VIII and his French counterpart, Francis I of France. It was so named because it took place in in a golden valley, but it was also so named because of the fantastically rich collection of gold tents um, that lined the valley um, and gave um, this particular European summit a wonderfully vivid, ornate, extravagant appearance. Um, It was the first meeting between the two European kings. It was a a chance for them to discuss um, foreign policy, but also it was a chance for them to eye each other up, really, to find out what, um, well, which one of them was the best king. Um, The golden tents, the fantastic occasion that that spread parties and festivities over these two weeks was really part of the language of competitive extravagance that all European kings this, they played this game to try and get to try and be the best Renaissance prince in Europe. Um, you could describe the field of the cloth of gold really as pure show business, um, with the glamour pussies of the French and English royalty um, smiling nobly, eating and drinking royally, and then being sick on the red carpet majestically. Another way of looking at it would be to say that it would was a conference of trivialities. This is what the Duke of Buckingham um, is said to have called it. Basically, the entire English court went over to the Pay of Calais in 1520, and there they were met with the entire French court, maybe about 10,000 people. A European summit, but also a party. This was a place for young people as much as anything else, where um, there were huge, enormous banquets, where they played games, um, where they danced, where they took part in jousts and tournaments, and um, acted in front of each other, wrestled, a kind of a combination of a royal tournament, you know, perhaps an Olympic Games, and also um, it's a knockout. We know about the field of cloth of gold because they are very detailed English and French accounts written about it. There are also some wonderful little survivals, accidental survivals perhaps, including um, three designs for tents um, that survive in a manuscript of the British Library. These are always assumed to be tent designs for the field of cloth of gold. They are wonderfully colourful um, pictures of these tents. Tents painted in the Tudor livery colours of green and white. Um, and there's one also in, in crimson with beautiful gold grotesque detailing with the king's beasts atop the tent poles, lions, dragons, um, Beaufort family greyhounds, hearts, stags and antelopes, all with the royal mottos picked out in gold as well. And these were more than just tents, just to give you a picture of what they actually looked like. These were almost vast temporary palaces. They were interlinked chambers connected by long galleries. And they were designed to basically to um, accommodate the full court um, that came to the Field of Cloth of Gold in 1520. All of the court offices, a mini court on the move, kitchens, um, offices, wardrobes, jewel houses, state rooms. And they were fully furnished tents. Their interiors were lined with expensive tapestries, with with cloths of gold, with gold and silver plate, and with furniture. And this isn't just camping furniture, this is four poster beds, the works. When the court travelled, it it travelled with with all of its furniture and all of its staff. This was all also part of the language of magnificence, you might call it. Henry's court was all about the explicit display of, of wealth and of power. And this was mostly seen in in two ways, through the richness of the material that was on display, with cloth of gold, with the most expensive tapestries available, and also through mottos and symbols that left no one in any doubt who owned all of this, who was actually in charge, Henry VIII himself. The tents themselves would have been canvas tents, dyed in different colours, and then covered with thousands of pounds of weight of ribbons, and expensive materials like cloth of gold, of silver, velvet, satin and all of these heraldic devices. Henry VIII wanted to be seen as a Renaissance prince more than anything else. 
he wasn't at this point the fat obese stereotype I suppose that we are familiar with from the later stages of his reign he was a young athletic charismatic ruler but spoiled uh, vainglorious and, and avaricious he wanted to be the best he wanted to be the most famous prince in Europe and everywhere he went he tried to impress this on people by ludicrously extravagant displays of wealth And when Henry went to the continent in 1520, he met somebody who was very like him. Francis was almost 26 in June 1520. Henry was 29. They were young men. Francis was many of the things Henry aspired to be. He had a much more powerful country, really, much more of a a power broker in European politics. But he was also wily, um, clever, astute. Um, A recent biographer, I think, also described him as being as randy as a cat, they competed, and the, and the tents are examples of all of this competitive extravagance. We're now standing in a magnificent wooden panelled room with a fine ceiling. Brett, can you describe where we are and tell us what we're looking at? There's a magnificent painting in front of us. Um, we're standing in Thomas Wolsey's apartments at Hampton Court Palace. Thomas Wolsey, of course, who was um, the owner of Hampton Court before Henry VIII took it over after Wolsey's fall in the late 1520s. These rooms are are now used for a display of royal collection paintings and also um, the Young Henry exhibition, which tells the story of the first half of Henry VIII's reign. The painting we're standing in front of is a royal collection painting called The Field of Cloth of Gold. It dates probably from the end of Henry VIII's reign, but is a wonderful sort of evocative statement about the, the glorious extravagance of this meeting in 1520. It's Henry looking back, probably, on the glories of his younger days. It shows him arriving um, at the temporary encampment, surrounded by these glorious gold tents, and also um, you have the fantastic English temporary palace built here um, by an army of people that Henry shipped over to to the area around Calais for the occasion. Um, The temporary palace was more than just a tent. It was built up to the first eight foot with with bricks, and then it had a timber walls with real glass windows inserted into it, um, with real stone chimneys. The painting is a continuous narrative painting. It it shows Henry arriving. It also shows him in the corner overlooking the tournament field where these fantastic jousts took place between the the cream of the English and French aristocracy. Um, It also shows um, the town of Guine in the background, um, which was where some of the English court stayed, which was in English territory around Calais, this tiny bit of land that England still held onto on continental Europe. Um, and the French village of Ardres in the background. It shows the first meeting of Henry and Francis right in the centre of the painting, embracing beneath this wonderfully golden tent. It shows what's probably the French banqueting pavilion, all covered in cloth of gold. And everywhere you see people as well, people dressed in fantastic costume. Almost the whole court went with Henry. Maybe about 10,000, 12,000 people were here, um, if you add up the English and French contingents not just the top courtiers, the top aristocrats, but also all of their servants, all of their courtiers. You see people of all walks of life in this painting. You see people drinking, eating, enjoying themselves. It's a wonderful sort of insight into the kind of court revelry that took place, not just in 1520, but but at the Tudor court in general. Um, There are some exotically dressed trumpeters in the right corner. There's somebody being sick behind the temporary palace, just to show you some of the, the excess that happened here. And you also see the cooks, people that work below stairs at court, and these fantastic, again, temporary kitchens that were built to feed all of these people assembled there in 1520. You read about um, purveyors, uh, shoppers, really, professional shoppers, being sent out in all directions for bulk buys and, and for special purchases. Thomas Taylor is paid, for example, 20 shillings for cream for the king's cakes. Um, but there are venison pies, there are whole pigeons, 10,000 pippins are, are provided, bushels of peas. There are exotic foods too, like storks, egrets, peacocks, sugared confectionery, subtleties, these amazing sort of cakes, I suppose we call them, that were formed in the shape of leopards and salamanders. 9,000 place, 8,000 whiting, 700 conga eels, 2,000 mackerel, three porpoises and a dolphin. And all of this was washed down by... 65,000 litres of Gascon wine and that's just the cheap stuff there was a similar amount of French wine and bucket loads of the expensive stuff too in fact right at the front of this painting in front of the uh, temporary palace you see these two 
elaborate wine fountains that were plumbed to flow with wine for periods of the two-week festivities. Those designs for tents at the Field of Cloth of Gold are on display at the British Library from the 23rd of April to the 6th of September 2009 in the exhibition Henry VIII, Man and Monarch. And you can see the painting Brett Dolman discussed here at Hampton Court Palace, which runs various temporary and permanent exhibitions on Henry VIII. Thank you for listening.